All right. Now for something different. Da 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 da. Okay. Data. Date data 1915 to 20. And why that's important is because the context, if you talk about data, oh, and you will, I will find a way to make you talk about data, you have to put the context in. Uh, because data without the context of trench warfare um, of World War I is, appears sort of like silly games and, and truly just making nonsense. But data with the backdrop of trench warfare where eight million people will die in this senseless and trench war going nowhere, uh, nonsense suddenly makes a lot of sense. So you need that backdrop. I'll be looking for that context backdrop. Um, very important. Remember, the beginnings of data were not the beginnings of an art, of an aesthetic. And I'm quoting Manifesto. The beginnings of data were the beginnings of disgust. So this idea of protest is going to be very important to data. The same way poetry, the poetry of the unconscious, is going to be very important to surrealism. Let's think of Dada as the deconstructive movement that happens during the war, and then surrealism, the subsequent, comes after it, so it belongs to that period between two world wars. It's the reconstructive movement of how to go on, you know, from that point on, and to um, to work with the unconscious to do it. Surrealism is very caught up. It's a psychological type of poetry, uh, data very caught up, uh, less in psychology and more in this kind of uh, war protest. All right, so the manifesto tells us a lot about data. It almost unfolds like an anti-manifesto. And you see one of the important words of data is anti, <laughs> to think in anti-terms. Even the manifesto, which is supposed to tell you what a movement is for and what it is against, they play with that. To be, uh, to be against data is to be data. All right, so, Double logic, data double logic. Data double logic is about subversion. Subversion of what the propaganda machine, the propaganda war machine, well, um, is uh, telling you. We are having all kinds of technical problems tonight. I'm going to be a bad woman. Da 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 the propaganda war machine is kind of, of uh, what's I? Anti. No, well, thank you. Subversion. Subversion. The idea of subverting the logic of that war machine, which that was no logic at all. So they are against reason and logic if it has led to World War One. And there's no country more reasonable, more logical, more efficient, more educated than Germany. Look where all that had led. So the sense of cultural betrayal uh, forces a kind of data cynical response. Um, so the data manifesto, I think, is kind of important for you to get a feel for, maybe to work with, you know, to shout the opposite of what another person says is be data order equals disorder. So it's constantly, constantly, I mean, this is the only lines I take really that hold on to the manifesto as something you can really hang on. It is for continuous contradiction. Because continuous contradiction never leads to resolution. And the second you resolve something or you kind of fix something is when your mind becomes a mindset, a fixed mindset. And that's what they're fighting against the bourgeoisie, the middle class that enabled this corrupt war to happen, um, this you know, immoral war to happen from their perspective. So there is a sense of trying to get people to think. That's their goal. This is the moment when art becomes about critical thinking and not about connoisseurship of whether it looks nice over the sofa. So it is um, an art about ideas, about really trying to change the way you think. That's all. And so you can see how they create an anti-art to challenge assumptions, to challenge Commodity values, is that the value of art? That it can be bought and sold um, for speculation. So trying to figure out what the value of art is in an age when 8 million people are dying. And for them, that cannot be art about art or art for art's sake. It's got to be uh, an art that, that deals with real life. And so they go to the streets to do that. They go to a club, uh, their uh, Club Voltaire, 
named ironically because Voltaire was the French philosopher of reason, and but reason had very little to do with what went on for Voltaire in their performance art. So they did performance art because that is art closer to life. So they don't want art on a pedestal. They don't want art with a capital A. So art that goes to the streets or that exists in a, a kind of um, a club space, which is an alternative space, beginning of thinking like that. Uh, so, you know, all kinds of ways to um, kind of think about art in all the wrong places. <laughs> uh, but for them, just going into your studio and making art about art, which is what they sort of saw cubism as being, was not justifiable. So, um, remember trench warfare, uh, how we talked about it, how it was going nowhere. Entrenchment was against the dynamics, and they are for dynamics of thinking. So they are the opposite of entrenchment. Basis data, is it an art, a philosophy, politics, is it fire insurance, is it state religion, or is data really energy? Um, or is it, and then caps, nothing. Don't get pretentious about data. Maybe it's just nothing. That is everything. So you see data being full of questions with no fixed answers. Definition is the death of data. Um, and remember, surrealism is a movement that will define itself again and again in different ways. So there's differences between these two movements, and you need to think about that. Tristan Zara is the man who wrote that data manifesto, if you want to refer to it. Um, okay, so you can see it's, it's not Mondrian's underlying order. Data is Mondrian's nightmare. Um, data dealing with the horror, the horror of entrenched warfare. Uh, and they're fighting their, um, their fight back in the streets of Zurich. We looked at Zurich, Switzerland. We also looked at Berlin data, uh, where things get more political. And then um, uh, a little bit of Paris data very quickly becomes surrealism. And then Duchamp brings data to New York as well. So data, data takes over the world. Right? But um, it's, it's really about not letting you forget about what's going on in those trenches. Uh, kind of keeping the, keeping, they have a kind of front that they're fighting too, a war front. But they're doing it back in these cabarets. They're doing it with their anti-art. They're doing it with performance art. OK, art, 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 art. I defy you to forget that name. I want one class to ever be able to get that name right on an exam, if it should happen to pop up. Remember, he has two first names. Hans is his German name. Jean is his French name. He is from that part of the world. It's either French or German, depending on who won the last war. So who is he supposed to fight against? He's supposed to put on a French uniform one day and kill Germans, and then a German uniform and kill French? It doesn't make any sense. So he goes to Zurich, Switzerland, which is neutral, and becomes a Dadaist. And uh, he is the one who brings us another important strategy of Dada that you should remember now, because you created a poem this way, uh, according to uh, the laws of chance. Now, that is already uh, a way of upsetting the traditional notions of how you're supposed to compose with the rational mind. Um, so letting things happen according to chance points out the data idea of absurdity, that this is the absurd, that there is no kind of, this isn't just a satire uh, and that implies there is a more correct way to be. The absurd is a deeper cutting philosophy that there is no correct ideal way. That the world itself is absurd, that the underlying uh, drama is an unreasoned order. And those are Arp's own words, an unreasoned order, that things are random. So whether you get hit in that trench or the guy next to you is random. And it's this sense of the absurd that's going to lead data to so many questions. Um, OK, so we have a. Uh, Collage arrange coin laws of chance. It starts with destruction. So think of Dada as a destructive act, uh, a deconstructive act where you rip up the drawing, you throw it on the ground, and then just how it falls um, is how you, you put it down. So it's not art as subjectivity. It's not art as rational um, experimentation, you know, ordering and it, composing. It's uh, art according to the like scientific laws of chance. Now, that's, again, um, the opposite of what uh, Mondrian is about, where everything is so calculated. Everything is so raised, uh, rationally um, thought of a controlling mind over nature. Now, uh, he does give us another work, our, the Fleur Manteau, which is sort of a flower um, uh, hammer kind of approach. You know, is, it, is it something that is organic? Is it a tool? 
uh, he's playing with contradictions. It's a contradictory work. In fact, it's so contradictory that it doesn't even know which end is up. We always know which end is up with Mondrian because it only works in one configuration. It's so rationally thought through that it only has one fixed presentation. Everything else, if you flip a Mondrian, you have data. It's, you have life out of order. Uh, but you can flip this arc every which way, and that suggests, again, a world that just doesn't have any difference between up and down, you know, the whole horizontal vertical thing. It's, it's just random. All right, so think about the philosophy behind that. Now we move to Berlin. That's Zurich data, Switzerland data. Um, we now move to Berlin data, where things are really at the center of where the war machine is going to um, erupt. And this is pretty political, and this is pretty dangerous terrain to be data in. George Gross, though, is a man who is best when he hates. He is inspired when he hates. Um, and boy, he has a lot to hate in this time period. War fever is how the masses can't wait for war to begin, the great um, adventure, World War I, that they're being romantic about. And you see humans are behaving like dogs, behaving like beasts, devolving, um, getting whiskers and fangs, um, and then just uh, mayhem in the streets. Uh, no kindness to humanity, sweet, kind humanity. So George Gross doesn't have any pretensions about humans having higher values. So you can see how it's going to be easy to map humanism onto something like machines in a, in a kind of data way to show how humans are being nothing but little wind-up toys doing what they're told, uh, marching off to their deaths. Um, so this is War Fever. Riot of the Insane also shows that that is the tone of the times. He does this right away. His style is really incisive. It looks childlike, but not childish. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very cutting. It it's bites. He's got a style that bites you in the ass, and you like it, according to the Dada mm -hmm. um, uh, The uh, Fifth for Active Service shows, again, just his contempt for the military, for the pillars of society, the church the, and military that's in with uh, the church in with military and, and the school. Uh, you get these, these I know nothing kind of you know, people who won't stand up and the absurdity that this rotting corpse is fit to be sent back for active service talks about just how tragic things were in Germany. Um, so they want the goddess, they want you to speak up. And then finally he gives us at five in the morning. Uh, he will stay a goddess for a long time to come. But five in the morning here shows uh, he's sympathetic with workers, but you know, to a certain point, he doesn't like the way they go along with everything. And when he's sympathetic, I mean, he just gets kind of wooden. But boy, he gets inspired when he hates. Um, so you see, uh, these are the workers at 5 a.m. going off to work. These are the exploiters, the factory owners who never pay their workers what they deserve. This is the one percent having a good time and wanting tax cuts. Okay, <laughs> while they're at it. So where does the artist fit in? Well, he's not exactly that. He's not one of them. Um, so he's just puking his steps out. So this is the idea of the beginnings of Dada, are not the beginnings of an art. Not about, uh, they're not pretentious about art, capital A. It's the beginnings of disgust. OK, um, Ralph Hausman, good friends with George Gross. Hausman, you can write down next to him, photo montage. Um, he's very important in terms of photo montage as a, uh, a new style of kind of collage taken to political purposes, to a kind of political uh, uh, social critique. Uh, and it can be pretty biting. Um, the photo montage that you see there is um, Totling at home. Totling was a Russian constructivist. You know? uh, that's a movement that really thought the answer is to work with technology, to build a bright new utopian future. Is that a utopia? In your view? Like, tomorrow will be a better day. Are the Dada's going to go see Annie tomorrow? Tomorrow? No, no. Yeah. And so this idea of utopian <laughs> dreams with machines, forget about it. So that's why their attitude of machines is much more cynical. You know, mapping humans on the machines is showing Humans act devolving to the state of machines, and machines acting all too human. Um, so that's what he's playing with there. The wooden head, uh, the spirit of our times, is their contempt for the bourgeoisie, who won't speak up. 
who acts like they don't have a brain in their head, who has a little mouth because they won't, they won't say anything against the powers that be, who have little tiny pupils because they don't see what's going on, who have a, a typeset over their ear because they only hear what the propaganda machine tells them and prints in the propaganda newspapers. And they just have a number for an identity. So it's a wooden head. Hello. There's nothing going on. It's a roar. You know, the, the data. The data response to everything. Roar. Hannah Hook is another data photo montage person, Rao Hoffman's girlfriend at the time. And um, you can see the data exhibit, which is all about getting the message out really more than uh, the aesthetics of these beautiful works of art. Uh, and her work is probably one of the best data photo montages we have. Cut with the kitchen knife. And look at, there's the complete title. Data through the last Weimar beer belly cultural epic of Germany. Uh, you don't have to know titles like that. But cut, cut with the kitchen knife. Data's gonna show you the cuts. It's gonna show you the slices. It's gonna show you the edges. It's gonna show you the anti. And that's pretty different from surrealist photo montage, which is more seamless like a dream. And I want you to think of music videos. Did you know, did you think come off of a data, rapid cut, rapid montage kind of approach that really deal with sort of absurd juxtapositions that uses the media against itself in a kind of subversive way to upstage it, to, to get you to critically think it. And then other movie videos usually that are going through something maybe more erotic that are like seamless dream fantasy. Then you've got something of the legacy of Dada and um, surrealism still very much with us in terms of st strategies. Dada is not a school. It is not a style. It is a movement. And it is continually a movement because it never wants to be fixed. It never wants to be defined. And it is um, more to more about strategies than styles. OK, you're going to need to think about the philosophies behind all that to really be able to work Dada and work it well on the exam. Um, Kurt Schwitters, one more Dadaist. What is his point? Why do I include him? Maybe someone in Hanover. The other Dadaists were a little worried he might be too aesthetic. Um, but Kurt Schwitters, maybe better than anybody, um, merges art with life. And Dada wants to do that. They don't want to keep it separate in the studio. They don't want to keep it um, on, a, on a pedestal in a museum or a gallery. So uh, this merging with life is because he, he creates um, found object kind of collages, but they keep breaking the frame, and then they become assemblages, and then they keep breaking the frame even further, and they become installations. And that's a real interesting move for, um, for Adonis to take, because that really is this merging of art and life. Um, so you can see him pulling from Cubism, but there's a difference, much less interest in the formal aspects uh, that Cubism uh, brought some things in for color, for shape, for form. Much more interested in his found materials, the life they led in the world. These kinds of uh, bits of junk that he sort of recycles. So the recycling junk quality is sort of what will end up like in a Rauschenberg's neo data someday. So picture with light center on the left, the stars picture on the right, and you can see he kind of hammers his pictures together. He uses things beyond just regular paint. So it's just not rocks, finesse. Remember the French are just part of that long tradition of La Belle Pantour, beautiful pain, central pain. That's not what this is about. Uh, as he moves along, it looks like Duchamp's little brother that he will never talk about, that horrible, that little, that little oh, I'm bad, I'm a messy Duchamp. Um, Merck's construction, Merck's is his word for this merging of art and life. Um, where he nails it together. doesn't know really whether it's a sculptural relief or a painting for continuous contradiction. Okala shows these found objects, how he kind of preserves their identity. He doesn't treat them as shapes the way you would probably do more in French cubist collage. And then finally, when he's pushed collage to assemblage, um, he ends up with installation, and that's his house, his merits bow, his merit's home, his merit's building, um, and uh, the whole thing became this kind of, of uh, data environment, destroyed, ironically, in World War II. All right, Duchamp. Duchamp is, we can connect him to data. He always is a kind of one-man movement because he's, he's someone who always shows you the limit points of other artists, uh, the limit points to their thinking, um, often. and. Uh, 
we we see the things that they are still not very open about. Duchamp uh, being um, a, a good example, though, of Dada in the way he really pushes Dada to be an art of ideas, an art about critical thinking, more than an art about creating precious objects or works of art. So he's a good one for anti-art strategies as well. One of those strategies, if you want to make art an uh, art of thinking, is uh, to think about chess, the game of chess, um, this, this preoccupation with, with a kind of performance of thinking. Uh, so his earliest paintings show his influence as he moved away from his very early paintings that we really wouldn't include him in art history about. Nice enough touch, but nothing, nothing um, noteworthy. Uh, but he very quickly grabs onto Cubism. And he grabs onto Cubism precisely because it is, for him, not mimetic, but it becomes a mental passage. Um, it involves a kind of conceptual way of thinking about things instead of picturing their outer appearances. So he likes the conceptual mind games um, that he sees Cubism opening up to. So a portrait of chess players as if he's getting inside the mindset um, by moving away from a mimetic depiction of two people playing chess. And there he is later in life playing chess when we thought he had given up art completely just to play chess. Uh, the King and Queen Traverse by Swift Nudes. Uh, all this stuff is happening between 1915-20, I mean this is even earlier, um, leading up to the large glass, which he begins in 1915. Um, the King and Queen comes right off the chess board. The idea of the King and Queen is male and female. Swift Nudes moving between them is the idea of something with friction going between something that the nude suggesting something perhaps erotic. So he's thinking perhaps of, of um, um, sexual play between our king and our queen, our male and our female. Uh, he also is really poking fun at these separate camps in the avant-garde. The Cubists who hate the futurists, so they didn't like the idea of swift nudes because that seems a reference to futurism. And the futurists who hate the Cubists, so they didn't like the term nudes in there, and he's showing that their little infighting are kind of limitations, our mindsets, set mindsets. And that's what Duchamp is constantly out there to open your mindset, to get you to think other. Uh, new descending a staircase is from this time period. Think about it, in the history of art, you hardly ever see nudes moving. <laughs> they stand still. Um, and they, if they did move, they wouldn't descend. So this is his beginning of the descent from painting itself. His also his interest in passage, in something shifting from one state to another. Um, even in a still painting as being something other than what it is, suggesting movement, suggesting a dynamics. But the movement he's really interested in is the movement of the mind. The movement of the mind away from a set fixed position. Um, so that is some of the things he's playing with here. And we kind of see it in the next work, which is the passage from Virgin to Bride. So think of Cezanne's passage, but think of it now as a mental operation, as the passage your mind has to make to think from bride, to think from virgin to bride, to think from one thing to its opposite or to its other. Uh, and so you see this kind of shift. Now look at how he's made cubism something very much his own. What he liked about cubism is he said it had no taste in it. It wasn't about aesthetic taste. Uh, he felt uh, that you could become, he said he liked mechanical drawing because it had no taste. Um, so his cubist work seemed to suggest already this merging of humans with machines. If this is a king and a queen or a virgin and a bride, they're, rec they're represented by these sorts of cubic planes in space. They seem sort of mechanical as if they cross with some kind of insect, you know? So it's the organic world of nature crossing with machines and somehow humans are implicated. So he has his own way of thinking about cubism right from the start. Then we get the passage from Virgin to Bride is leaving that sort of king and queen behind from the chessboard and now moving toward the large glass, which will be known as the Bride's Fair by her bachelor's even. So he starts working on the chocolate grinder, and that's a painting of a machine. And he's trying to paint it just in a kind of mechanical way, because he hates the stink of artist's ego. Here's your line for Duchamp. I wanted to put art back at the service of the mind. 
let me put art back at the service of the moment. So he wants to think of the artist as someone engaged very much in ideas. Ideas are your true medium. And these works are, are not things, not little commodity, precious objects, aesthetic, aesthetic uh, objects and masterpieces, as much as pointing to other ideas. So the work of art, remember what McGreed tells us later? That the painting is not <coughs> simply what it represents. It's always other, because it's really about an idea, more than just what it's represented. So plugging into that mind, um, and this is why Duchamp, of course, is considered our first conceptual artist before there's a conceptual movement. The Noe Dada was a conceptual movement, right? That is perhaps a state of mind. So um, he does the chocolate grinder. That's our bachelor machine. Our bachelor machine that grinds his own chocolate, <laughs> grinding his own chocolate, and uh, fluffy milk white chocolate comes from between the rollers as you grind away. Okay, so. Uh, the sexual innuendos are there. Thinking about machines gets him to think about the ready-made. You are all expected to understand the ready-made concept of Duchamp. You should link that concept to Duchamp. It's a very interesting development of mixed media. The ready-made is not quite the same as a found object. A found object could come from nature, right? It could be a driftwood, it could be a shell, it could be anything you washes up on shore. The surrealists would be very poetic about found objects. The ready-made means it was machine-made. And it's already made. You don't have to make it. So it's a machine-made object that was probably made for a very utilitarian purpose, never suspecting that it would end up as art someday. And the question of whether a ready-made is a work of art, he doesn't answer. He just calls them ready-mades and thinks of them as anti-art. So what makes them art? Uh, it's not just that the artist Duchamp chose them. It's not just that he changes their context, but of course, if he puts one of these ready-mades in a museum, you're going to think about them differently than you would if, if the urinal were back in the bathroom, right? But it's, so context does shake up meaning, but what really makes that object, that base object, turn into art? Where does it turn into art? The object itself doesn't change. It changes in the mind. He does a radical thing here with ready-mades, he really strips away everything else so that the art object really only exists in the mind when you think about it. When you think about it. And that's what he wants you to do. Think about it. Um, it's kind of alchemy. They were all trying to say, how can you take base metal and turn it into gold? <laughs> Why? Well, give me a urinal and I'll turn it into a fountain. <laughs> okay. But we'll do it in the mind. So he takes away. I want you to think about what he takes away. He takes away the idea of a precious object. They're not precious. They're machine made. They're not one of a kind unique. He takes away uniqueness. He takes away even authorship because they weren't kind of made by the artist. Um, so these are objects that really challenge uniqueness, um, one of a kind. They're multiples. And if they can still yield a kind of art experience, then we see those aren't the necessary criteria for some things, some objects to be considered art. The necessary criteria is, is your mind, and your mind has to become unset to start thinking about the inside. That's the transformation. That's the outcome. Your mind has to think other. Your mind has to think other than a urinal, other than a bottle wrap, other than a bicycle wheel. And it's in that flip. So it's the flip of the mind set, you know, to a different way of thinking, to an alternative other way of thinking gets us going. Um, bicycle wheels ready made assist because it's mounted on a stool that didn't come that way, so we give it that little assist. Now, one of the things ready made challenges is the idea of the unique work of art, the aura of the unique work of art that uh, um, Benjamin had written about. So, what you start to see is uh, you don't need the original work of art because it's the idea that counts. The idea is the work of art. Art as idea is the idea. So it doesn't matter whether it's the original urinal or not. Now, it's so important that he didn't try and make money on this and do a whole bunch of them. Remember, he didn't buy and sell them. He just kept them around the studio. This is not about a way to kind of, you know, break into the art world by being a bad boy and making a fortune on this. This is very much a, a kind of experiment in anti-art and to see if you can push the art object to the point where it really exists as an idea. He was very fascinated by, you know, in some sense, what a data ready-made asks you to do. 
is to see it from a different perspective, to think it from a different perspective. And so he liked these different points of view, and he loved the shadows that Ready Mades cast, because he started to think if a ready made cast is a 3D object that casts a 2D shadow, then maybe our 3D bodies are shadows of a 4D world. So he's thinking about all these kinds of ideas of the fourth dimension in space and time. And where is the art object if it really exists in an abstract mental um, idea? Bottle back, uh, just one simple object. He didn't do anything to it. He didn't even give it a different name. Uh, so it's just how this can start to be an interesting piece of sculpture. We saw it suggestive in many ways. And it also is an example of cage construction sculpture. Um, a type of new sculpture that's happened after cubism. The dematerialization of the solid object. So the cube sculpture is no longer solid mass. It is about space. And so this sculpture really is about space in interesting ways and conjures up all kinds of associations. So something like a bottle rack never intended to be art can be a kind of real, it can yield a sculptural experience if we choose to tune in and look at it that way, to think of it that way. Now the case, in Tori's case, he's in New York City, so this is New York data. He is submitting um, a urinal to the group. Remember, he got himself on the board, so this is sort of performance aspect of this. All Armut had to do was make, uh, pay his money. Remember, Armut, Richard Mudd is the manufacturer of urinals. Um, and then they had to take it. They had to be democratic. Those were the rules. But of course, he knew the jury would not want to take this. And so he had set this up to, again, test the avant-garde's mindsets, their fixed mindsets, their limited mindsets. And he kind of argued the point. Um, uh, so what we get is this uh, urinal, Buddha of the bathroom, uh, that really takes us from something very base and scatological, scatological referring to the things we usually repress, like the fact that we're pissing and pooping machines. Um, and, he, and, and he raises it to something higher, like the level of the fountain, just with the mention of the name. Uh, and it becomes this very suggestive little work of art. It seems both phallic and moon like It's like bisexual. Um, so all these kinds of ways he plays with these notions. So you should be able to tackle that ready-made situation. I have had this on the exam before, and people have said that the artist was our month. Yeah. And, you know, seriously, in a way, you, you can make a case. They are my case, but we still are looking for you to recognize Duchamp, and I'd be looking for you to recognize the term ready-made. You want to learn some of these terminologies that's kind of important that you know the backdrop for the way some of us work today with found objects or with mixed media and how you might work conceptually with them. Um, I talk a lot about figure based figure face um, kind of, of ways of being one thing at a time thinker. So what it takes to shift your mind. You know, we can look at it as a urinal or we can look at it as a fountain, but it's very hard to see them at once. And I do think Duchamp is fascinated by the moment of the shift, by the moment of the passage. When you're thinking this and now you're thinking that. Like what could happen if you could freeze that moment? And I think our surrealists are kind of interested in that too, right? Because they're very interested in when contradictions cease to be contradictory. But it's like you hover in that in-between. I think these artists are looking for in-between spaces to operate in. So there it is, it's the base thing. Now, one more ready-made is this idea of using actually a mechanical reproduction of a work of art. It's machine-produced, mechanical reproduction. And Walter Benjamin, this great thinker and writer, had already talked about what happens to the aura of the original work of art in an age of mechanical reproduction. And this is Duchamp taking that on. He's also taking on gender bending. I want you to see how much we tend to think postmodernism is still unpacking Duchamp. Um, that we are still working on gender issues like this. We are still working on issues of um, mechanical reproduction and originals. Uh, and he plays a lot with phonetic puns. She's hot down below. She's got a hot ass. So this is done right after the war is over. They felt that uh, they were pacifists during the war. They protested the war. They felt the war had accomplished nothing. They really got nowhere with this, except that 8 million people were dead. Um, so you know, there's, they still feel there's a lot to be data about. Uh, there's still a lot to think about. He puts the um, goatee, and you know, in a weird way, it's his homage to Leonardo, the ultimate thinking person's artist. 
if ever there was one. Uh, but it's cloaked a bit in parody. Uh, and uh, he is playing with that gender bending because he said, when I put that goatee in that, that, um, beard, that goatee and mustache, you realize that Mona Lisa was a man. I mean, it's not so much that this looks like Mona Lisa in drag. It's after you look at this, this looks so natural, that that starts to look like the drag version. So it's also what he can do to kind of get you to rethink previous art. Uh, he said one of the problems with uh, previous art is that habit is a great deadener um, in, in some sense, or that habit is uh, kind of like a um, term. Habit can, becomes like a, a, like a kind of drug that we have a certain sort of hand response to this work, an addictive sort of drug that, that stops you from really seeing it and thinking about it. So he gets you to maybe look at that work like you have with before. Remember his alter ego, he actually signed this work because he doesn't think of them as works of art, they're ready made. He signed it Rose de la Vie. She's the artist of it. And Rose de la Vie, Eros, that's life. That becomes his alter ego. All right, so that gets us to his most notorious work, Rights for Fair by Our Bachelors Even, um, a title that never is completed, just like the work is deliberately not completed because it leaves you in the pause. It leaves you between virgin and bride. In some ways, that's exactly where complexity theory leads you. Complexity theory is really, to me, the theory of new, it's a theory of creativity. It's a theory that explains new emergences. In complexity theory, you're between two things. She's, she's partly virgin, but not completely virgin anymore. And she's partly bride, but not completely bride. She's got bits of both, and you're in that pause space. You're in that flip. You're in that ship where these contradictory things seem to coexist. Um, so we have a work that you need to know two movements. You need to know that it's the bachelor machine down below. So it is dotted down here. That's a human's mapped onto machines acting all too mechanically. And it is the bride's realm of desire up above. So when you're in desire, you're in the realm of surreal. So surreal is up on top. It is a work so complicated we can never explain it because it doesn't plug into the wall and run on electricity. It plugs into the mind. We need his notes. So it comes with its own cliff notes, so to speak, with its own cliff notes. Um, and they help explain the text. You can see the notes are almost like Leonardo drawings, kind of explaining the function of all of these things so that we get a sense of how this work, which is, remember, a machine whose sole function is to make love. I will say that with very white voice to make sweet, sweet love. Okay, so um, a machine of soul functions to make love is clearly a mapping, a data mapping of humans onto machines. Um, so I've taken away the backdrop so you can see the bachelor machine that grinds his own chocolate. Uh, and what starts it all, you should remember, is the bride's illuminating gas, her desire. She is the internal combustion machine. We're back to female <coughs> desire. And sees her desire, she just, it just can happen from within. She's got an internal combustion engine. Her desire just starts, and that starts it up. Our bachelors, they're not internal combustion. They feed off of, they need her illuminating gasoline. They need her love gasoline to run. So when she releases her love gasoline, they start churning. <laughs> and then um, rolling uh, that milk chocolate. Uh, that starts the sleigh going back and forth. So that's this water sleigh. And here's the water wheel. He will later reference these things in that late work he did. Uh, the malic molds are the male-like molds that are cast. So what goes on in this machine is a constant shift of things um, uh, getting wet, uh, things moving this way or that, things going um, hard and casting. So it's kind of all innuendos of the sex act. Uh, now, remember, after it goes through the malic molds, so these are male-like molds, and they get filled up and go hard, it goes through these cones. That's where he let dust accumulate. So there's chance elements. There's really all the data kind of elements, leaving something to chance and then sealing it. Then it, after all that mechanism, absurdly, what comes out, he says, is a little drip. So all that to create a little drip, which is supposed to ricochet up through these eye charts, which he silvered up in the glass, and those are your ocular witnesses, your three voyeurs. And then you get to the bars, which are supposed to be her dress, her clothes, 
And that's where you're supposed to have this boxing, the boxing, um, he called it the boxing match. Like a little, a, a little uh, electrical charge was supposed to spark, and then her clothes would come off, and she'd be stripped bare, and you could penetrate right into breath territory. But when he didn't feel that, he just left her, uh, 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 all, come on, boys, come on, bachelors, I'm ready for you. And they never make it there. So he leaves you on the pause. That's why he called it a hilarious picture, and he called it a delay in glass. I remember it's pictured on glass, like it's transparent, but it sure doesn't, it's no window extension of our world, it's only into the mind, um, and that's the only way it runs. So she's left forever on high, not completely ravished, but not really completely virgin anymore, and our badges are all just looking at her longingly. So I would want you to think about the bride part where she's full of desire, and she's that elusive object of desire, does make it more, um, surreal on top and it's less mechanical you know she sort of drifts and floats that's supposed to be her veil flying in the wind uh, the crack that finally happened it happens according to the laws of chance when it hit a stone it cracked uh, and cracked from the bachelor all the way up kind of he left it there intentionally because he thought that was great but the tension <laughs> finally penetrated through and so he left the, uh, that chance effect as any good goddess should so there he is playing chess. We think he's not working anymore. We think he's not doing anything, but he was secretly working on that last work that came out after his death, the given. Um, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, okay, so right now you would go straight to Seville. This is what you missed. We moved from Dada to Russian constructivist. This is the work of Tatlin, who the Dadas were making fun of in Russia. So this follows in the 20s. You're not going to get tested on it, but it is. This idea, build it and they will come. It's the first of three movements that really think if you work with technology, you can build a brave new world, a better tomorrow. Unfortunately, they couldn't do it. Um, that thing was supposed to be twice the size of the uh, Empire State Building. And all the parts inside moved and evolved at different paces. It was a great space time building, all incredible. But there was no way they could pull it off. So it just ended up existing as a model, which is what happened with the heroic age of communism. It was almost too ambitious. All of these movements in between, though, what I want you to get a feel for that you'll understand better, surrealism, it is the flip side of a number of movements that think, well, if we work with the machine, and if we work with the machine aesthetic, we will be able to create a better world. Surrealism is the flip side, the side that no. There's an underlying disturbance. You've forgotten what we learned from the trenches. You've forgotten what we learned from warfare. The irrational. So they go in a different direction. The only place this was ever built was on the internet. And that's what it would look like. Pretty fucking cool. Um, the uh, other, he was the only one I ever hold you responsible for, Totling. But you can see our Russian constructivists are really taking cubism and moving it into construction sculpture. And what I wanted you to see is how much it's the dematerialization of the solid object into these extraordinary um, sculptures. And finally, last one behind now, a machine art that plugs into the wall. It's the light space modulator. So you see this flip side to what our Dadas are doing and to what our surrealists are doing. He will eventually move from Russian constructivism to Bauhaus and spread those ideas. This is the American precisionism that I think is so different from O'Keefe where after the war they celebrate our machine culture, our factories, where they talk about this as being our classic American. They have no criticism of the uh, pollution that's coming with all of this, and they're painting in a kind of way that's a little bit like a Mondrian, but in America there's no way you can go completely abstract. So they celebrate machine culture. They celebrate machine beauty. Um, so you can see that's going to be the flip side of uh, and it's all about our manifest destiny and now with technology. And we still are in that mindset, that precisionist mindset. And Jimmy Bauhaus is the last of those movements. Um, I wanted you just to get the three slogans will tell you something. Form follows function. Look at the Germany Bauhaus School compared to the Paris School of Fine Arts on the left. Look at the Germany Bauhaus compared to the Paris Opera. Form follows function. Less is more. Art and technology, a new unity. Do you see the utopian dreams? 
the beginnings of modern architecture are just taking the lessons of cubism and applying them to design. All of these movements back up what Mondrian was doing. That idea between two world wars of building a utopian, better world. A world with order and precision. A world um, where form follows function. And see, they're applying Mondrian's ideas. And they're not dealing with a building with um, decorations on it. So, and there was a great faculty there. Uh, Kandinsky was there for 10 years, still being spiritual with those. He brings in geometry to his work, and Paul Clay is there. So it was not a sterile place at all. It was very creative. And it led to the international school. Now, if that's what you missed, I wanted you just to appreciate all the names, all the movements. You don't have to study, okay? But if you do need to understand there is that flip side that believes in order that believes in things um, moving toward that better world. Surrealism is not that. Okay, so that's what that else is happening in that period 1925 to 30.